So I'm looking at Lord of the Flies by William Golding with a specific focus today on structure, form and context and how to embed those particular parts of the assessment and criteria into responses. So now we start to think about what we're assessed on and we, uh, we focus on assessment objective one where we reference the text and support our understanding of what's going on. Assessment objective two where we think about structure, form and language in our analysis and assessment objective three where we get the contextual linkage and understanding of the text. We need to make sure that we balance uh, our response to these particular assessment criteria based on the weightings uh, in the specification but in uh, a good essay I'd expect to be seeing reference to these particular assessment objectives frequently. So when we come to think about pre-preparing responses, form is a key area uh, in terms of Golding's choice of form for Lord of the Flies. I mean, it was published in 1954, and this was in an era when there was an increased focus on Hollywood and cinema in America in, in, in that particular period. And so in terms of choosing this particular form, it does come back to Golding's own influences of reading novels like Coral Island, Treasure Island as a young boy, and I suppose allowing those novels to really fill his imagination with these uh, characters who, who were lifelike. And obviously as a teacher at, at a grammar school for boys, there was a message there that he wanted to explore. And so in terms of choosing to write a novel over a play or poem, Golding is enabled uh, the um, authority to really uh, shape his readers' uh, interpretation and their uh, imagination to a far greater extent than he would be able to if he were to choose to write a play or a poem uh, where there's more dramatic license and there's more freedom for interpretation to uh, occur. So in terms of choosing to write a novel, Golding very cleverly actually shapes his reader's opinion through the language, through the interactions that he so vividly describes for us. And so then after you thought about what you'd actually write for form, then you want to start actually uh, preparing how you might revise for that. And so a range of questions or a range of um, uh, summative points that you can actually return to. You've written down the sentences and you can start to actually build on new essays by incorporating these particular points into your essays at the relevant stages. So something like this where you draw out the key information that you wanted to share about form and then just break them down into manageable chunks of information that you could possibly put on flash cards or build into mind maps um, and, but certainly so that you can start to routinely uh, build these into your responses. So we can start to pre-prepare responses to structure in Lord of the Flies because it follows a builder's Roman structure. So we can map that change from childhood innocence where the boys are initially presented on the beach at the beginning of the book through the rites of passage where they start to discover food and start to come up with rules and, and regulations for society to an ultimate uh, change in the rite of passage where it becomes much more savage and primitive in its focus and then this ultimate experience where Ralph weeps for the end of innocence at the end of the book. Uh, very explicitly for Golding sharing that Bildung's Roman message so that the reader in reading the book undergoes that rite of passage, undergoes that journey that the boys also share. So we can start to shape those ideas in terms of the paragraph and you can see uh, an example on the right hand side of the page that has reference to the text. But obviously try and find your own and try and build on this uh, but you want to start to try and embed this into future responses to make sure that you're hitting the AO2 criteria. So very similar to form, we start to build on what we've just written and break it down to its sentence structure so that we've got these points that we can raise throughout our essay. I mean, you've got to constantly remind yourself that structure, form and context aren't just bolt-ons that we end add to the end of paragraphs or the end of essays. These need to be embedded responses to get us above a grade six at GCSE. So breaking them down into these uh, very basic sentences and then starting to think how we can embed these uh, and extend some of our analysis it is a really useful uh, revision resource and method to go through. And then we do want to think about Golding's message. I mean, it's important once we've thought about the influences on Golding and his experiences in World War II and as a school teacher. And we start to understand that actually there was a message that he was trying to share with us. And certainly there are symbols that represent this message to the reader as we start to reflect on the novel. Uh, and there's lots of different interpretations that we can start to develop. So I've put a starting point on, on the green side of the board so that you can just start to think about how particular characters represent certain things to the reader and what this might be in terms of the intention that Golding had with his message.
Now, usually just before uh, setting an essay question, I get students to respond on structure and form just to think about actually what they would write because we've got to routinely get these into our responses and it is something that we have to really think about when we're under the pressures of the exam. So uh, from the very first lessons we discuss structure, we discuss form, and we come up with particular phrases, particular things that we want to say about that. And then the, the key bit in terms of getting that higher grade into that level 6 sort of uh, band where we're looking at 26 to 30 marks is actually perceptively drawing those particular features of structure, features of form into your response and making it relevant to the question. So just before we start writing we have a quick reflection about the types of things we're looking for and then we're ready to go. And then obviously uh, one of the other routines that I try and get students into very early on is, is breaking down chapters into key quotes and then thinking about key themes that they connect to. So obviously we can use a range of these quotes to actually discuss a range of different themes or characters or ideas that are presented to us in the novel. But it's good practice to just get students to pick out, say, between 10 and 15 quotes from each chapter and start to try and use those uh, and relate them to different themes as part of their routine revision that they're doing at home. And then ultimately the day of the exam comes and I've got a question. So the way that I like to plan is in the form of a mind map. I generally follow this particular structure to a plan in most of the responses that I do. So I put the question dead centre in the middle and I constantly am reminded of the key focus of that question. So explore how Golding presents and develops the theme of control. So I'm really focused now on this idea of control. I'm already starting to think of other synonyms of that word in my head like power and dominance. Uh, and then I'm starting to think about perhaps how I might shape the alternative response to that which is about people being subordinate and led. So I've got these ideas going on in my head. Now obviously with this particular text I don't have a copy of it in the exam so most of the things that I've been preparing and, and going over in my routine revision comes down to six choices of quote in terms of the way that I like to plan. So control at the beginning of the book when I'm thinking about it is this idea of Ralph blowing the conch. He's the first character to have control in terms of this symbol of power, this symbol of dominance. He's also the first character that the reader is introduced to. So we see that perhaps Golding is controlling the reader in focusing on Ralph and Ralph's particular journey over any other character. So a reference to that from around about chapter two is quite useful. I then want to start to think about the other side to that. So I've got Ralph's initial control, but then who starts to challenge that? And I start to think about Jack. Uh, and this particular quote about Jack seizing the conch is a really interesting use of the regular verb in terms of showing his physical power and aggression. And obviously he is that little bit, little bit older than Ralph and so might be uh, slightly more developed physically. But we certainly need to see a dominance in terms of the way that Jack seizes, he snatches, he does other things in terms of aggressive verbs throughout the book. And then finally I wanted to look at perhaps Golding controlling us in terms of we have options here. We the tribe looking at these two figures of power and dominance and the way that they're not getting on, we have a choice. And so developing that through the presentation of the two continents of experience through chapter three um, is, is a very significant quote and one that I can use quite frequently in my responses. And then the other thing that I've got to be clear on is to make sure to actually refer to a range of parts of the text to make sure that I'm showing a real exploration of um, how this particular theme control is developed throughout it. So I've got three quotes from towards the beginning of the text. And I want to start to think a little bit more further on into the book. Um, so my next quote is actually uh, quite interesting because it links to the quote from chapter three and comes in chapter four. But it's that idea of something snapping, something uh, completely untangible, untouchable, uh, breaking between the two boys. Um, and then having this feeling that it's actually happened. So when the control is lost, uh, what ensues then is chaos. And then I start to develop this particular idea in terms of um, uh, Jack's understanding of who should talk and who has power and who has control over the other boys. And then ultimately, uh, I wanted to focus on that descent into savagery with this particular essay. And so I have that particular quote from chapter 10. And in terms of putting these together, I am focusing on uh, a sort of societal control in my essay, and I would want to make that clear. But I've mapped out the plan, I'm very clear on how I might use this, and I suppose the next thing that I could do is start to prepare the quotes by underlining keywords or phrases in terms of what I would iceberg in my response. And then finally, I want to talk about how uh, students actually structure their responses to hit the criteria. 
So we're looking at AO1, AO2 and AO3, reference the text, analysis of language structure and form, and then this uh, contextual understanding in terms of what's going on. So for each of the sections to a paragraph response of so about three sentences, three to four sentences, longer if I want to extend it, um, I'm going to focus on a PEA, iceberg and evaluative comment structure. So we look at the PEA, which is Golding presents the initial control of the voice through the symbol of the conch in the declarative. Now I've used my linguistic terminology in categorizing the type of sentence as a declarative, so that's AO2. And then I've got reference to the text in red, Ralph finished blowing the conch, which is AO1. So I'm starting to clearly hit the criteria in the mark scheme. Now when I then analyse it, which suggests that Ralph has the initial leadership of a group as he is the using the first symbol of power, it's quite a limited to clear point, it could be developed further. But what I've done is I've started to actually uh, analyse the text and hit AO1 and AO2. Now by developing that further through the focus of the iceberg, so the ice iceberg looks at a particular phrase as part of a larger quote, and then looks at the connotation and the hidden meaning behind that particular word choice. So I've taken out this verb blowing, I've suggested that Ralph controls the power through his breath and that everyone should listen to him. And I've focused on a little bit more of the idea that this is a perceptive comment in the making because when you start to think about the use of breath and how he controls through his voice, and that's basically all he has, then I could really draw that to a much more perceptive point from what it is at the moment, which is quite a clear point. And then I extend that a little bit further by focusing on the evaluative comment and thinking about this particular symbol of the conch and the control that it presents. And I'm balancing it up and in this particular version I think that it's an effective point and therefore I say so. So once you've got the hang of writing a clear PEA iceberg evaluative comment structure, then you can start to routinely get in the habit of doing that in your essay. And you can, you can be absolutely confident in the knowledge that you will be hitting the assessment one and the assessment two criteria in particular, as well as having the opportunity to focus on context and develop your response to hit the AO3 criteria. So it's just a matter of actually built, developing these routines and, and understanding that by categorizing language, we start to show terminology and therefore we start to hit AO2. So here's another example, uh, and the quote that I'm focusing on this is the idea of two continents of experience. If you read the response, you'll see that it's quite clear. And in terms of developing that, my feedback to this particular student would focus on actually explaining in more detail uh, what features of symbolism we are actually being shown through the noun continents. So this idea of cultural expectations of the community-driven Ralph with the survival of the fittest driven uh, and possibly more capitalist Jack and how actually Golding is representing communism and capitalism through those characters and the clash and the destructive nature of that clash that ensues from that. Now if this uh, particular student was able to exp explore that in more detail in any of the parts of the analysis or even the evaluative comment then obviously this response would develop into a 5, 6, 7 in terms of an overall grade. And then in terms of this final uh, PEA, it's just to show really how you can develop uh, consistently uh, the clear responses that, that you're able to offer uh, the examiner just by focusing on that simple point evidence analysis. And then by looking at the iceberg, we start to go into a more precise use of reference to the text. And then we go into that evaluative comment. But this type of response isn't really going to get you much more than a five. So you also need to start developing and embedding um, how you're going to focus on structure and form and consistently try and pull your response into that perceptive area where you're really focusing on what the intention was uh, for Golding publishing this book when he did.